Hi, Susie. Hi, Kathy. Here we are today and uh, on our heart to hearts. Um, this time we're talking about shadow work and how facing it can really help you to love yourself more as you are and help you manifest the life that you really want to live. So you've got more love, more connection, more confidence, more acceptance and more joy in your life. And I know that this is something that we've talked quite a lot about and there's uh, quite a juicy topic all over. So why don't you why don't you tell me what you think is your shadow? Right. Um, well, first of all, I do think it's a very, very juicy topic and uh, we seem to stumble upon it almost every time we chat, which is really um, which is really why we're doing this chat anyway and uh, focusing on it. But for me, um, the shadow is um, a part of myself that I guess I am not really don't um, like and I tend to um, hide it and kind of put it away. Um, and the other thing that I find with shadow work, since I started to kind of really do some reading around it, is um, the shadow for me also is um, just when I see something in somebody else um, that I have a really intense feeling about, it brings up a really intense emotion for me. Um, so if it's a negative shadow, I, I, um, I probably would see that person and have a very kind of deep, intense dislike or deep irritation for that person. Um, and the light side of the shadow is that I look up to that person. So I see something in somebody that I think is just amazing, wonderful, and that, um, you know, I kind of, I could never be like that. Okay. So what about you, Kathy? What does shadow mean for you? Um, so, so my, I think my what a direct experience I, had of doing shadow work where I kind of got got to meet it face to face so to speak uh was I was doing some EFT with a friend or um some kind of like um maybe it was so it was some kind of tapping therapy we were doing and uh I got to meet this part of me that I remember from when I was a teenager I used to just hate myself so much. I mean, it was when I look back to that younger me that was so scared and I just felt I was loathsome and worthless and it was just very dark and it was, um, so I found this like, we, we went, we were going through some sort of little process where I found an aspect of me that was almost like a creature that was all hidden in a dark corner and just wasn't, didn't want to be in the light it didn't want to be seen it wanted to hide and I think um and so the process of like the the healing work that we did was about a, kind of gently calling that creature out from this dirty corner where it, it wasn't uh it didn't feel worthy of even seeing the light I don't think and um it, it then felt really free but it took I me mean, it took a long time it was quite an interesting session that that was to find that that much stuff was still hidden in me. So I think it's all of that stuff that, you know, I've done decades of work since I was that messed up teenager and uh, I hadn't realized it was still in there. So I think mm. the shadow for me is about uh, all the things that we don't find acceptable, that, that we bury as far down deep as we can, That all the things that we don't want people to see about us yeah, that we yeah. don't want to have exposed um that it doesn't feel safe to ex 
too for anybody to see because we'll get judged or rejected or yeah. um something will happen to us or people will see the real truth about who I am and and uh, even though that's not true it's yeah. that you know is that part of me back then that thought that was true and, and uh that's what's so magical about the shadow work to go in and meet it and to actually just shine light into that part for it to realize that it's not as loathsome and awful as it thought it was, or that there is forgiveness for it or, or love anyway, unconditionally. And yeah. um, I, that's why this has been such a, I think it's a transformational thing for people to do in their, on their healing journey and their personal development journey. Why do, why do you think you hidden it in, in the past or how did you discover that, um, how did you rediscover it? What was your journey? So I think I rediscovered it um, very like you in um, reading books and certainly during my um, transformational um, journey uh, in psychotherapy and during my psychotherapy course, we totally worked with the shadow and I'd learned a lot about where it came from, which was Carl Jung originally. And um, so being educated about this phenomena to do with the shadow. And I remember reading a book that really, really helped me to understand it. It's absolutely, you and I both love this book, you know, Dark Side of the Light Chaser, mm. the Dark Side of the Light Chasers by Debbie Ford. And I went to see Debbie Ford when she came to London um, wow. many years ago. And um, it was really, she was such a real person when she was standing in front of you, having read the book several times and um, worked on it um, during my psychotherapy training. Um, to actually see her in person before she died and um, see how she dealt with in a room full of people who were asking her questions about the shadow really, really made me appreciate and realize that this was an area to work on far more in fact more than even just the passion side you know it's almost like the flip coin of of wanting your passions and what's blocking you and on the other side is your shadow you know it's like um so I, like you, I, I became really, if I'm honest, I actually became quite obsessed about it because I understood how much you had to dive into parts of yourself that were hidden or you didn't, you rejected, you just completely rejected. They were bad. They were stuck somewhere, never to be seen again. And I like when you said about, you know, shining a light on it because it takes a lot of courage, Kathy, to do that. Mm -hmm. And I had, I think I had a lot of support um, with lots of different therapists who believe it, believed in shadow work to almost hold my hand in looking at and recovering and reviving those, I would honestly say dead parts of myself. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think what you what you just said there about having a therapist or some it's someone to hold safe space for That's you right. to actually risk going into what like when it, when you're going there it feels like you are that loathsome person doesn't yeah. it all of the stuff that you buried feels so real that you almost uh become that identity again and and you ex re-experience all the feelings and the self-hatred and or, or whatever is there and uh and then to have someone holding space for you who's who knows that, that that's not who you are and they see you as the beautiful soul that you really are yes. at the same time as welcoming the shadow so that the shadow then it, it doesn't have um, power over you to manipulate in the background. I mean, it's frightened. It doesn't want to be seen. So it will do everything it can not to kind of like be pulled into the limelight or, uh, but sometimes it does kind of just unleash itself, doesn't it? And, and I know this comes up um, 
you know, if you get triggered by other people or maybe if you've been drinking or drugs or something that would, um, that would let it be unleashed in some way when you weren't in control. But um, that's when it's quite destructive and, and it has a, such a lot of power, doesn't it? So oh, massive amount of power. You know, I mean, it doesn't have as much power, does it, anymore for both of us, having um, exposed it so many times. But what was interesting when you were talking is that I was I was wanting to ask you, you know, um, you've mentioned um, about, for you, it's like a little creature, and I really see that. I really, really see that. Um, but how how do you recognise the shadow now? in yourself uh, I think yeah, I'm getting a lot more connected with my body as it so like I'll feel some sort of tension or resistance or I'll watch my thoughts right. in um if someone triggers me or okay. and I'll I think I've always been someone that thought well it must be me before I'll think someone else has done something you know it's like I'll take responsibility for it that's been a, a pattern um so I'll always go and explore something where I feel like well things things don't feel like they're flowing or moving easily so I'll go and do some inner exploration and also I find inner child work really powerful so if there is part of me that I don't know it might be feeling a bit stroppy or um a bit victimy maybe or you know it's it um possibly those kind of those kind of things are what are coming to mind at the moment so to go in and and talk to that part of me that just feels really stroppy and like um a bit spiky and scratchy because i'm not normally like that and also if i notice people reacting to me yeah uh, or I can feel this change in the energy. I'm like, oh, something's, yeah. something's off here, and I'll check myself. It's like, what, what am I doing? What, what am I reacting to? And if I can, I'll, I'll just go off and um, talk to myself, <laughs> give myself a talking to. But no, like in a good way, sort of to yeah. connect in with what this feeling. It might feel a little like it's a young me that feels really unlistened to, or. Um, she, she needs to be heard this this inner part of me because I think that's what where the a lot of the shadow kind of stuff comes from is just because we pushed it away so much when you do start listening to it it starts coming forward more and uh you know that can be quite overwhelming as well at the start of this kind of journey but um because it's like finally she's listening <laughs> and so more more parts of us might want to be witnessed and seen and heard um and i think i think every time you just kind of develop a, develop your own ways of of listening and i i i mean when i was doing um the flow project work and yeah. when i work with clients and help them in a, a visioning process and you mentioned this before that it's like the the flip side you have a vision of where you want to go to and you have that comfort zone that you have to step out of and that's where you meet all this all your obstacles and blocks and the shadow that doesn't want you to be that new identity that you do need to be in order to receive that um, vision or to step into that version of you that has that reality that you're wanting. Yes. All of this has to come up and come out. And I think when you can expect it to do that and you're sort of prepared for, right, you know, I'm doing a big leap here. I'm going to have some challenges. I might need some support because my mind is going to, have a lot to say and I and the chances are I'm going to feel a lot of old stuff yeah. and if someone can't help me through then I might believe it <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah so that's kind of how I do it I, and I do get a lot of support like that. So I think um, one of the things that um, you mentioned is feeling it in the body and feeling that something is a little bit out of sync you know and you're when you're with someone and you've been triggered and you sense, don't you? 
and you said that you sense um, something, you sense something physical in your body. Would mm -hmm. you say that's one way to recognize the shadow for you? Not everybody yes. is in the body, you know, but right. one, one strong way for you to recognize it would be a physical feeling. Yeah, it's getting more that way because I've been doing such a lot of body work that brings me back into my body. But because I didn't used to be able to do this so much because I would take off out of body and I was um, kind of, I, you know, I'd, I'd done a lot of spiritual development work that was all about love and light and peace and harmony and yeah. it didn't go down this road. It was all about, you know, keeping your vibration high and but that creates a lot of pressure when you're feeling really shit and it's like you want to be that but uh and you're stuck in that dark place um I, I'm sure you you've come across this with um in your own life and with clients it just seems such a common thing on on our path doesn't it really it does it does very very much so and I I really really do um resonate with everything that you're saying you know and I think for me um, coming back to my body um, was when I started actually started really seriously doing yoga over 20 years ago um, and in my view that because it's such a physical thing I was brought back um, into my body and mm -hmm. what I then recognized was when I felt hurt for instance by somebody something somebody said my previous um, behavior would have been to have the identity of um, love and light, forgiveness, um, it's okay, they didn't mean it, um, let's try and find the positive in that yeah. and what that was really doing was basically ignoring and you mentioned about you know the um, younger part of yourself, ignoring your authentic senses and as a child I think um, it's unsafe to do that it's unsafe to say or well, that's what the child thinks mm. it's if the, if the child is in an environment where um, she or he isn't really the views aren't heard um, it's unsafe to do that you know, if a child, for instance, like my daughter would, my daughter always spoke truth. You know, from the moment she could speak and she felt really safe with her dad, her brother and her grandparents. But her personality spoke truth. And none of us were like that. So if she didn't like an auntie, so there would be an example, you know, she hadn't seen her aunties for a while or friends. I mean, not just aunties, but friends. And um, if they suddenly kind of came up to her, threw their arms around her because they knew her, you know, um, and she didn't know them, she would just pull back, push them away and go hide behind Nanny's skirt. And Nanny would say, oh, darling, you know, come and sit on my lap and it's all right. You don't have to say hello to that person. You don't have to be kind to that person. It's understandable that you don't know that person and it's okay to behave the way you do. Wow, really? That's amazing. Totally. And always, 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 always. So that doesn't happen to us. And mm -hmm. I watched my mother-in-law do that. Whereas my behavior to my daughter was different because yeah. I was, I was behaved very, I was treated very differently. You know, you, you're not rude to adults. If an adult likes you and an adult comes to talk to you, you have to be friendly back to the adult. But that adult could be a nasty piece of work. Mm. And if as a child, my intuition said that that person, I don't like that person, that person's not a nice person as was my experience in my life, I had to like everybody. And it was just a sign of respect. You know, adults were always right. Um, I spent the rest of my life ignoring that little intuition or that part of myself that said, but this person isn't right. Whereas my daughter used to say, that person's not right. And we'd go, oh, blimey, that's good. You're right there. Yeah. You know, we all encouraged her to do that. Um, so as she grew up, um, she had the confidence to mm -hmm. 
like who she liked, disliked who she liked. And I mean, obviously we had to teach her to be, as she got older to say, you don't have to like that person. You don't have to hang out with that person, but you don't need to be rude. Yeah. yeah. But the most important thing is Kathy, she felt safe to like or dislike who she wanted and choose to be with who she wanted. Yeah, I think that a lot of the shadows that are created within the personality come from the conditioning, don't they? That whether it's familial or, or um, cultural, um, and yeah, the, well, as a child, you just learn, kind of learn to be inauthentic depending on what the situation is around you. And that's what we spend then our adult lives unpicking. <laughs> But this, um, it's, it's to, to not go into it and to be just the love and life that's a kind of that's a, a way of spiritually bypassing isn't it of just being love and light and um seeing the the good side and it's a lesson I'll learn it I'm sure you've been there <laughs> I've been there so many times and it and I think once I realized that um I didn't have to go there it wasn't necessarily um, my responsibility or I was taking something on from someone else, but the uh, I could talk to that part of myself that was scared or that felt disempowered or useless or that it didn't have a voice or it just it had no worth or, or um, I guess it was, a lot of it was about power. It just never felt powerful. And so it stayed in the shadows and uh, and I don't do that now. <laughs> so that part of me really get, gets to come out. And I think, but I had to go in there and really convince it yeah. that it was okay to, to be and that it wasn't an awful person or, or the fact that it was, and another, this is a, another big one for a lot of women, I think, probably men, a lot of men too, but, um, be uh, learning the idea that being gentle or soft and feminine was not a good thing because it was weak. And uh, I had that kind of drummed into me that, well, if that's because that is me and therefore, you know, I am quite gentle and feminine, but I never got taught that there was a strength in that. And when I, I went into the shadow part of me to let it know that it was okay as it was, more than okay, that it was actually loved and powerful. And I had to go through all of that um, feeling of being weak and pathetic and I can't do anything. And I mean, that, that was just, um, you know, the way that it had twisted quite a lot of ideas that were all sort of tied up like knots of string. I had to, be with it hold space for it with some support to unpick that and then gently help it realize that that is actually a massive gift to be this gentle person that is really strong as well and that um you know when you look at there's so many women who have struggled maybe in their early lives who were still loving and compassionate and strong and they'll fight for the people that they really care about and they they don't hate they don't they didn't um lose themselves they didn't um kind of you know go go and hurt other people and be like what was done to them so there's huge strength in in gentleness and i yeah i i would i think going into the shadow part to actually pull out these parts that we really hide there's these amazing gems. I mean, I shared that story of mine and with a group of women and there was a, so many of them in tears afterwards going, oh, that's me too. Wow. And it was them because they're the women, you know, they have such inspiring stories of strength in it from adversity, but they hadn't seen it as strength. Yeah. And, that, and then they were just like shining and go, wow, that's, that's, yeah, I'm strong. So I don't know, I think there's just a million stories that we could possibly talk about. But what what would you say um, was one of your most kind of like really clear memories of diving into the shadow and what, what did you find? 
I would say, um, certainly for me, anger has always been something I had trouble with. And um, so my shadow was my relationship with anger. And um, if I'm honest, I don't actually know where that comes from, but I would do everything I could when I was younger to avoid becoming angry or showing any form of, of anger, you know, based on similarly the theme that we're talking about is that no matter what, you can set boundaries and say no um, without ever being angry. And I think that the spiritual books and paths that I took, anger was always looked upon as bad, really evil, really bad. Um, and so I did everything I could to not go there, cover it up, not acknowledge it like it never existed. Um, and it got to the point where I guess, I'm just guessing that it got so bad in my body that eventually um, it almost went to the other extreme, Kathy, where I actually suddenly felt rage. And I had to do some research on that because I couldn't stop it anymore. You know, if something, um, something or somebody triggered me um, and now I was in my body, I suddenly felt rage. And the reason why that would happen, I realized that I'd, again, I'd studied myself and done some therapy is that the pattern of behavior that I had was that I didn't have a good relationship with anger or recognizing that as being at an early stage healthy. So for mm -hmm. instance, I learned irritation is a level of anger. And then there was another level of anger is annoyance. And then the next level, if you, you know, turn it up the volume, it's anger. And then the final volume is rage. So what I learned is, and I'm still learning by the way, that when somebody did something that I, felt slightly irritated about, it was all right to say, you know, I, oh, don't do that. That's a bit irritating. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling a bit irritated. Would you mind not doing that? I didn't because of my unhealthy relationship with anger. So I would say in my, to myself, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Now, if that person continues to do the same thing and the irritation I realized became bigger to now that person's annoying me. But that person does not know that I was even irritated by the behavior, has no idea because I haven't communicated that. But I'm now feeling annoyance and I block it again and say, no, it's fine, you can deal with this. You can deal with this, you know, I don't, it's fine. Um, and then I would notice that my relationship with that person is changing because actually what I'm really feeling is angry. I can't bear that behavior anymore, you know? Um, and it could be something very, very simple. Um, and then finally, I guess it got to the point where I had bottled up that feeling and it got bigger and bigger and bigger somewhere in my body, you know, physically that when the person finally does something. And of course they're increasing their behavior because they don't know it's annoying or <laughs> causing me to feel any discomfort. Um, it's amplified, the behavior is amplified. And then what I used to do many years ago is go into a rage of, why do you always do that? That just drives me insane. And I would go into, into a, a bout of raging communication. And then that person would kind of basically go, whoa, where did that come from? Yeah. There's like a fireball been thrown at them. And they said, well, why didn't you tell me in the first place? Well, why didn't you know? 
Mm. But they don't know. I'm sure a lot of people can really relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? The, um, the, the, like you're talking about the levels of anger. And I think the, the, the work almost as you get, as you, as you start looking at it, this, you start to become uh, more sensitive to, oh, I'm in irritation or annoyance. I better check myself and see where are my boundaries being crossed where am I letting them be crossed yes. Yes. I'm not speaking okay it this makes me feel uncomfortable or I don't like this or um it's not making someone else wrong it's just you defining your your edges isn't it and what's okay yes. for you and uh, I I know I've done that so many times so why do we not do that if, if this is something that is quite common and you relate to it as well Kathy why is it then at the point of irritation or annoyance, for instance, with you, um, in the past, perhaps you haven't communicated that irritation. And as you say, it's an uncomfortable feeling. Um, so what is that? Why, why haven't we communicated that? Well, I think that comes down to a lot of cultural conditioning about, well, for me, uh, and um, you know, I'm sure this is for a lot of people, for, especially for women, it's not, sort of acceptable to be angry because there's a lot of power in anger isn't there and in, in expressing in expressing anger there's a lot of power and so um women have typically been kind of like angry woman over there that's you know okay keep her over there and not there's never been so, something that has been um valued and well what a powerful woman it's it's a disruptive woman and someone who is going to sort of upset the status quo or or question or make a stand or something and uh make a stand against the power structures that were are in place so i think there's a lot of kind of conditioning that stops us allowing ourselves to be angry but we've never also maybe never been taught like you said before how to be angry in a healthy way how to recognize it and express it in a healthy way because anger is usually just from a uh, having a boundary crossed okay yeah that is not communicated and if someone doesn't know that they're doing that then and they keep doing it it's up to it's your responsibility or my responsibility to communicate where our boundaries are and to What's the fear of the communication what is our fear of communicating? So if, you know, um, it's setting a boundary and saying, I don't like that every time you walk in through the door, for instance, you bang it, you know, and it's going to break. Um, you know, would you mind shutting it gently? What is the fear of communicating to that person? that that is something that is, if it's a personal thing, no one else minds the fact that you bang the door when you come in, but I'm just communicating that that particular thing is just, please, could you stop doing that? Because I'm owning it that every time you do that, I feel really agitated or irritated. So what is my fear of communicating that to that person? What do I think is going to happen if I communicate that? Well, is that a fear? Because the way that you just said that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, and yeah, I never used to do it. And I still have trouble, Kathy. You know, and I guess, I mean, I don't know. what. Do, I, I, all right, so my fear would be that you won't like me if I tell you, if I set a boundary. So maybe, you know, thinking about it now as I've said it, is I maybe somebody who really doesn't like um, the fear is that you won't like me. It is false evidence appearing real mm -hmm. because when I have put that boundary in place and I've communicated it in a way that is owning it, which perhaps I didn't know how to do before. Maybe I didn't, I wasn't taught how to communicate something by owning it. There we are. Now, okay. when I'm taught and I've learned to own it and make it personal, Oh, by the way, would you mind shutting that door when you come in? It's when you bang it, it really <laughs> agitates me, it irritates me. Would you mind, um, you know, shutting it gently? 
Now, if I had done that in the past and I would have had a response from someone who is an angry person, for instance, yell or shout back at me and say, you know, start accusing me for being a nutter and everybody else likes it. And why the hell don't I like it? I think my fear would be that that person could respond in that way. So it's better to keep it quiet. So it's back to keeping things in harmony and calm because maybe in the past I've had an experience of a very angry person. Yeah. But, and, you, know, you could never set a boundary with an angry person. You could never ever say what you wanted because bang, you were always wrong, perhaps. Do you think? I, th um, I think that when you set a boundary from your power and you're owning it and you're communicating it, the energy that you're sending out cannot be responded to from anger from a from that person that you described that mm -hmm. kind of energy because there's not something to bounce off as a someone who's in that energy if you were in fear you were That's pulling it. back and that energy goes towards so yeah. that there's an energy dynamic happening there but i think um i think we're afraid of the reaction potentially or um conflict or, you know confronting someone especially if it's like coming from your power and you're threatening someone else's power position like someone that um maybe assumes a superiority position and you're like oh, can you do this for me because this is this is important and this it upsets me when you when you do this you're owning it but and you're setting a clear boundary but if you're worried about what their reaction is going to be or that you won't get it that I think if you follow the threads back of, oh, why do I feel like that? And I mean, what you've just done now and exploring your own threads in that little scenario, that's that's what we need to do more of. And that, you know. And, and I think you're right, because what I've recognized in myself is that there are, there are two types of people for me. So number one is that that person, if I know that person, that person is going to, going to bully me back and be angry with me. So best not to say anything. The other type of person is if I said that to that person who's very sensitive, they won't like me anymore because they don't like disharmony either. Mm. So far better to keep it, keep it, you know, we all like each other. We're all OK. And I accept you for who you are and you accept me for who I am, which means that I have to tolerate anything that you do and everything that you do. And actually, what I have discovered personally is that the fear was false. When I have communicated to the angry person, could you do that? That angry person has respected me. Mm. When I have communicated to the very sensitive person, um, I let go of the need for approval from them. So if they did decide that my request was unreasonable and they never came back to me, it was okay for me to be okay with that. I didn't need that person's approval or that person to be in my life any longer because actually, and you, you know, you mentioned earlier about one of the things about working with the shadow was you learn to love yourself in um, love your higher self, love yourself, not in a vain way, but love values and principles that we all share. And if I'm asking you to stop doing something that, is causing me pain, it is a reasonable request. Yes. It's not unreasonable. And if you do react in whatever way that you react, I can let go of the outcome because I'm in my power, you know, and it's okay to ask for what I want. And that to me is what I've learned is, is everybody loving themselves and having a right to ask for if somebody says yes or no, that's entirely up to them. But it really is okay, part of the process, to be able to set a boundary, especially if you're doing it in the manner that we've described, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, um, a lot of it is about sort of you owning who you are and what's okay for you, and then sort of training you have to stand in that and own that so that others learn how to treat you. It's, it's always about your, where your boundary is that, that, because people will, if you think about people are energetically meeting, they'll meet where the edge is. 
they'll meet where the, the connection is. And so if you don't have a boundary and it comes straight at you, uh, and or you merge and then you end up in codependency with, with someone, say if it's a partnership, then you you end up having to like unravel to to get that clarity of like, well, here's me and here's you, and th this is what's okay and this is not okay. And uh, that's much tougher than it is to set those boundaries at the beginning. If, if you have that awareness to set them. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I suppose from a, a spiritual level, um, all experience is just experience, whether, uh, whether it isn't like, it's like source doesn't judge positive and negative on, on emotions and feelings. It's just all felt experience as a being here in this physical body on earth. And um, it's kind of only us that say, have this judgment of this is okay and this isn't. And we push away the things that we don't want to feel. And we move towards the things that we do want to feel. Uh, but that keeps us small, it, it divides us, doesn't it? And the, I think the journey of being here to have a richer journey in life and to embrace so much more of ourselves and be more whole is to bring those parts back because that gives, it makes us bigger. It makes us be more expansive and we're here to live as m the most expansive life that we can and be all that we can be. And that involves meeting those aspects. Um, but I think it's really important if, uh, if this kind of work is new to someone or someone maybe I, I don't think I could have done this kind of work when I was young, because I, if I'd gone into my shadow on my own, uh, I would have just found all of this stuff that just proved that I was an awful person and therefore I would have probably have got a lot worse. So I think it's important if you have very low self-esteem or you come with lots of self-loathing or you just don't feel good about yourself at the moment don't do this on your own get some really get some support um to someone to hold that space for you like we said before um but this is it's like a it's the path of fire for transformation isn't it i think it anyway. Definitely it is. And one of the things that as you were talking that um, came to mind was, I don't know if you saw that film, the cartoon film, Kathy. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. Um, was it Insights or something where you've got anger and fear? And do you know which film I mean? No. Oh, you must, must, must. I, I must find it and send it to you. Um, and pretty much um, Joy is the main character and she is um, really sort of trying the, the, the other character to get sadness to keep out of the way in this little girl's um, experience, you know, and they're all in her. And so you get to see her going through um, a change, going through a change, um, of situation in her life and her parents moving and she's always had a lovely happy childhood and then and joy has always kind of kept her upbeat and joyful and then the parents move and she doesn't move to a very good place and other emotions come in and joy won't let sadness anywhere near her you know <laughs> and joy won't let anger anywhere near her and joy won't let fear anywhere near her you know joy wants to be joy full and and of course gradually the others slip in somehow and it's it's a fascinating film actually um and i just remember particularly in mindfulness one of the things that um first things that i get people to recognize um are the different inverted commas negative emotions that we need to befriend mm. And, you know, you mentioned, for me, vulnerability is really, really something I don't think society, for men or women, for many, many, many years, has encouraged. Um, and by vulnerability, being able to show someone that you're hurt, and that's one of the emotions, being able to show someone that you're sad, um, that being able to show someone that um, you are in a state of fear. 
Mm. You know, and and what I've already mentioned is the whole setting boundary, being able to show somebody that you feel angry by mm. a certain behavior. Um, and I think joy isn't the only emotion that we as human beings are allowed. You know, happiness, joy, and calm are an it's like the different colors of the rainbow or, you know, the four seasons of the year. When you see a place and you see it in the summer, it's fantastic. But for me, the shadow is the winter in you and mm. the autumn in you and the spring in you. And when you, I guess for me, the shadow is like almost a hologram. And when you get to first meet somebody and be in a relationship, for instance, you know, the honeymoon period will be the joy. And then gradually, when you get to become more familiar with that person, you trust that person and you you feel that that person, you can reveal another authentic side of you, like a hologram, because you feel safe with that person, you may show an anger uh, and you may show that you're sad. And if, if that person holds you in all of those seasons and all of those emotions, I think that's a true connection in a relationship. Also, the... I just had that, I remember going, when I was in Portugal and I was in this, I lived in this valley, it was over winter while I was house sitting and there was no other neighbors really that I could see from where I was looking from my view, but you could see all these broken down little houses in the valley and the sun would like come up and this little broken down cottage you, uh, before the sun was on it it sort of blended into the background you couldn't really see it as soon as the sun hit it and it was this kind of golden stone yeah. it had a very dark shadow and it burst out on the hillside and it was like it shone and it was such a metaphor for me of in order to stand out and be whole and three-dimensional and real you've got both and both are so equally important and that was, um, you know, it, was, it, it just was such a good picture in my head. Yeah. And, and I liked, you know, going back a little bit to um, what you said about when you identify um, the shadowy parts of yourself and you have the courage to shine a torch and, you know, have the sun shining on it and you have the support with you to help you to go through that or because you know that if you don't, it accumulates and you're not going to be your whole self. Mm. Um, and I think all of that understanding um, and what you do in order to work with what work with what we, we, we've said, you know, different aspects of the shadow um, what is really, really interesting is that we probably do need to give ourselves some time to do a bit of investigation. And one of the things that I noticed you mentioned at the beginning, part of that investigation is exploring. And it's exploring your thoughts around what's happening mm. and maybe even questioning them and I mentioned earlier you know something I often do if I know that I'm triggered and I'm having a inverted commas negative emotion or my energy is a bit low I do like you Kathy said now I give myself time you know, and I remember when I was in America doing uh, the coaching course, the Americans used to call it being in 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 the funk. <laughs> I really like that. You know, I'm in a funk, and um, and it's so true. It's like I just make a mental note. I'm in a funk. I want to be my bright, um, abundant self again. I'm going to take some time out, uh, you know, literally allocate some time out in the diary for myself to investigate what happened, who it was with, what was brought up for me, and the self-talk. Mm. You know, and I, I noticed you were talking about, at the beginning, you, you were kind of going into what I would call, in coaching, we call the self-talk, you know, the limiting thoughts around a limiting belief. Mm -hmm. And listening to that and maybe being quite nurturing and 
investigating, exploring and saying, well, actually, you know, let's have a real look at this. Is that really true? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little process, isn't it? Yeah. And do you have, do you have, I mean, I call that my seven step process, but do you have, what do you do with your clients? Um, you know, when, when you recognize that perhaps it's a recurring shadow that's blocking them? Well, I tend to kind of in, in the session, take them into that a very nurturing held space that then connects them to their infinite self. So they have their, their sense of their own power at the same time as kind of going in to meet where the, the, as it comes back to the body again, where the, the body shows where the resistance is and you feel into the body and really kind of put your awareness in a somatic sense, a memory starts to come up or it feels like something that reminds you of when you were seven or, or and an event that happened then, that where this tension in the body originated right and there's a lot of um fears and and judgments and all, all the shadow is around that mm -hmm. that that young you took on yeah. and so i go in with the client like guiding them and they have their higher self with guiding them as well so they feel empowered to look at that frame by frame and see what really did happen and how they made the meanings about themselves that they did and what they heard from another person, if there was another person involved. And the, when they're coming from their higher self and which is in, in unconditional love, they can unconditionally love that younger part of themselves so that that feels validated and seen and they don't have to then carry that belief anymore. And also they can forgive the person who they feel hurt by or slighted by or whatever happened and see them as just a, a soul on this path and that and what they learned from this meeting or this event because there's always something uh, beneficial that even in, in the darkest times that we've had they've put us on another trajectory and given us some kind of skills and abilities that we wouldn't have learned otherwise. So it's about taking the gifts from it. And once all of that is unpacked, there's no energy left in that trigger anymore for, for it. So it just, you know, you just don't get triggered by that kind of thing. Quite thing. so intensely anyway. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there might be different nuances at different times, but usually it's, it's pretty much gone. So yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. But I think one last thing maybe to say about doing shadow work, and I think you kind of touched on it a bit with what you were talking about in, in um, how you did it in America, when you're in the funk and then you go into the, the looking and you take that time for yourself. I think it's really important also to stay in that kind of like scrutiny and doing shadow work all the time. It's really important to, do it for a bit and then go and do something that makes you feel good. Totally. Because it's always going to be there. It's always, you can always come back to it, but to go and do something that, that lifts you, otherwise it can bring you down. And yeah. um, I think, it, you know, you have to manage that for yourself, but I think that's probably something that I've, I've dived into it. So, you know, with such gusto and thought, yes, here we go. Let's transform. Uh, and then it's been quite hard to get out of when I find myself in the downward spiral. So it's a balance. And it's like different levels, isn't it? You know, different layers. And we can work on different layers over a period of time. It doesn't all have to be done all at once, you know. Yeah, there's no rush, is there? Yeah, there's no rush. And I think that's, for me, that's wisdom. That For me, that is wisdom that I've now found. Um, because certainly when I was doing my psychotherapy um, diploma, I found, you know, for a few years, I was in a funk for a long time because weekend after weekend after weekend, we were going into this shadowy stuff. Mm 
and there was you know before I took and then I had life and I had to go and look after children had a job and then I'd be back on the course again for long weekends sometimes from Thursday to Sunday doing very very deep work and looking at my past and doing inner child work and um I think it's really important now what I do exactly like you're suggesting you know many years later is I recognize that it's a layer you know I have been triggered and I do a little bit of work and no doubt I will have another opportunity yeah. <laughs> there's no end of it is there I don't need to go you know it's like this final thing I've got to resolve it now which I had when I was younger and I think for me that's you know uh, one of my favorite um Buddhist uh, teachers um, of mindfulness, Pema Chudran, she says, you know, you've just, it, it, it is always going to be there. And I think at the end of the day, it is really just a matter of loving kindness and giving yourself loving kindness enough so that you can get back into having some joy. And like you say, it's, it's, it'll always be there, you know, and you can just work chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it. You know, and she says, it's like, sometimes you have four steps forward and five steps back and that's okay. Mm. Some days you find you have four steps forward and two steps back and you go, yay. <laughs> again, sometimes you make progress. <laughs> I think again, at a spiritual level, as part of the, you know, we're here as a collective of humanity that, this work of us doing the shadow work for ourselves is what helps raise the level of consciousness on humanity for well, absolutely for humanity. Yeah. absolutely and I, and I you know just to finish on that I really really don't and I know you believe the same thing I genuinely genuinely don't believe that it is per it is possible to um just follow the passions and the passions and the passions and not have some shadow work come up. I, I personally don't believe, I think you've got to be very highly enlightened on this planet to, um, to not have any, any shadow work come up. And I think, you know, the, the title that we chose for this is embracing the shadow. I think it's really, it's important to kind of come, to, come back to that, you know, um, that's what embracing the shadow as we've talked means. That's been such a beautiful topic to explore and dive into today. So uh, I think we've kind of come to the end of that for now, but I'm sure we'll talk about it again. So thanks so much, Susie, and see you next time. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. See you next time. Bye-bye.